Jason Davis heads a project called Climate Stories. He has been recording people speaking about solastalgia, a homesickness one gets while still at home because the climate is changing. I've experienced this, especially in the winter, as I hardly ever use my cross-country skis anymore. Climate change looks different here in Western Mass than it does in other parts of the world. The impacts are less dramatic, but we are experiencing these changes along with everybody else. In this chapter, I speak to several members of our community who have made climate change a focus of their professional work in quite diverse ways. I first wanted to ask a scientist how climate change is impacting our environment right here in Northampton. I reached out to the Arcadia Audubon Center for an answer. Impacts of climate change are already happening right here in Northampton. We're standing in front of a New England iconic species the sugar maple. And this is a tree that may not be able to live here by the end of the century because of climate change. Due to less snow protecting the roots in the winter and then also less rain during the summer. It stresses the trees and when they die, they can't regrow. They'll have to move their range to the north if they're going to survive, and other trees, like oaks and hickories, will be taking their place. The sugaring industry is already seeing impacts. Uh, luckily for them, the technology has increased to the point where their yields are roughly the same, but because the sugaring season comes so much earlier and ends so much earlier, they're seeing less yield per tree. These are the flood markers that mark the high water lines in different flood events that have happened in Northampton throughout history. So you can see the one down here is 2011. This is the most recent flood that we had and the, flood, the waters came up and flooded the trails. In 1984, the water came up to about halfway across the ridge and that filled the valley. And then in 1936, that's where the water line was that filled downtown Northampton to the point where people could canoe into Hadley. And so we are on the shores of the the um, Mill River Oxbow, which leads into the Connecticut River Oxbow. And we can expect more and more of these types of floods because we're getting 50 to 70% more water per storm than we did in the 1950s. And that means that 100-year floods are going to be more like 10-year floods. So we're here at Fire Pond, which is a vernal pool. And vernal pools are pools that fill with snow melt and spring rain in the springtime. This is a really important place for uh, wood frogs, salamanders, fairy shrimp to lay their eggs. It's a really safe, nice nursery, really important spaces. However, in years like this year, where we had basically no snowpack, there was nothing to melt into this pool. So it filled up early with some of the spring rain and the frogs were able to come and lay their eggs. Um, however, it's already starting to dry up. And this is something that wouldn't generally dry up until maybe July or August. It needs to give those animals enough time to metamorphose and to turn into adults, get up into the woods before the water completely dries out. This is an effect of having just significantly less snow. Another change that we're already seeing is that new birds and wildlife are moving into the area. So for example, the red-bellied woodpecker is an animal that wasn't able to live here before, but now because our climate has changed, the conditions are better and they can live here and find what they need in order to survive. Similar with the turkey vultures, which people might see all the time. Um, a bird that we may lose because of climate change is our state bird, the black-capped chickadee. In fact, by 2050, they might not even be able to live in most of the eastern part of this state and just be able to live in the Berkshires. Thinking about these climate changes, whether locally or globally, is quite overwhelming. The science is complex and scary. Governmental responses are slow and inadequate. Sometimes it's easier to tune it all out. I spoke to a local therapist who helps clients work through this feeling of overwhelm. So the idea of climate change, it's like the universe, you can't wrap your mind around it, it's too big. So noticing if you're trying to do that, like how can I have it, and then you move into overwhelm right away. Mm -hmm. And then you are stuck because you're like, well, it's either I try and I can't or I'm in overwhelm. So naming, I'm terrified about climate change. And so then you start to look at, well, what are my resources? What do I love to do? 
people who are actually actively working are, are managing their emotions much better than someone who's isolating and trying to work it out on their own or just moves into denial and is just kind of like, well, or, you know, or even, even when you make a choice like, okay, well, I better, you know, see the world and, you know, oh, well, you make a choice like that. Um, there's an, that, I don't think that's going to feel so good ultimately. And creativity is so liberating in that way. Once you get started, once you get through that experience, whatever has blocked someone from saying, I, oh, I can't do that, I don't know how to do that, that's, that's what I hope for everyone. Beth, along with other climate activists, have organized annual Interdependence Day events to speak out about climate change. Jason Davis's work wrestles with the weight of climate change too. He layers personal stories with original music to invite the listener into the emotional experience of climate change. I think for many of us on a, lot, on a certain level, it's really hard to relate to climate change as something that we deal with every day. Many of us probably feel pretty distant from this process, right? If you're living here, you might not be going to these, you might turn on cable news and you might watch a little bit, but it's, it's people sitting in a room and, and talking about you know, emissions targets. Obviously very important, I'm not dismissing this, but it's a frame for understanding climate change that might leave some people feeling separated from the process. Um, then of course there's a scientific frame, and without a doubt, you know, we need climate science. Without climate science, we would not know what's going on, we would not understand the urgency of the issue. Um, but there's also the question of how is that science communicated? So it might not be, you know, we're living through, God forbid, a, a severe drought or a, a destructive hurricane, but even like noticing the seasons change. You know, I know for me, I've noticed that for sure. Just like when is spring starting? You know, it's earlier. Um, what does it feel like when there's a heat wave in January? It's not a destructive event, but something feels different. predict that the day after Halloween would be the first rain. And over the years, we don't see that normal cycle anymore. Alex Jarrett, a recently elected city councilor in Northampton, has made addressing climate change a focus of his work as well. He is a co-founder of Pedal People, a carbon-free trash transportation company. Hearing his story about starting Pedal People was heartening because it's a reminder that shifts in behavior necessary to address the threats of climate change are possible, and in some cases, already happening. So when we started Pedal People in 2002, and we saw this, this gap in Northampton, no, there was no city service for trash and recycling. And um, it was either done by a truck, or it was done by people bringing it themselves, usually by a motor vehicle, to a transfer station. And so we thought, well, let's try this crazy idea using a bicycle and a bike trailer. I remember that first winter, biking along, having no idea how to do it, like physically, like what to wear, or how would roads to take. Um, the bike paths weren't plowed then. So it's been, it'll be 18 years this year, um, at the end of this year. And so over the years, seeing how gradually there was a shift, and a part of it had to do with the awareness of climate change and the awareness of environmental uh, responsibility in a new way. But also it was something that Northampton started to become proud of. Uh, rather than it being something strange. And part of that had to do when, with when we took over the contract with the city to empty all the trash and recycling barrels in downtown. So it was sort of this realization that yes, you can do things differently, but it's gonna look a little weird sometimes. We became something that was totally strange and abnormal and is still pretty odd, but it's something that people are like, we live in Northampton and we're really proud of having this. Peggy McLeod has been engaged with climate change on the local level for a long time. She talked to me about her shift in focus from energy and carbon emissions to biodiversity and supporting the essential work of pollination in our landscapes. 
She runs an all-volunteer, not-for-profit called Western Mass Pollinator Networks. Their current focus is on establishing pollinator neighborhoods. For about three years, we've been teaching people how to plant pollinator-friendly gardens to support native bees and, um, you know, to learn more about what the bees need. And we're talking about not only the honeybee, actually, we, we sort of try to avoid mentioning the honeybee because most people only know about honeybees and bumblebees. So we've been t talking about uh, how many species there are in Massachusetts, which is over 350 species. And uh, most people are aghast, you know, what? <laughs> um, and they're all different shapes and sizes. So what's important is each native bee, each bee, each pollinator species um, prefers certain plants. Certain plants are visited by many different bees and those are called kind of generalist pollinator plants. And other, other particular uh, plant species are specialists to a bee or several bees that co-evolved with that plant species. So that's some of the knowledge that we're hoping more people will learn about. So when they look at their backyard, they don't just say, oh, I want some roses. I want a beautiful oak tree. I want some daisies. They're also gardening for the pollinators and for the wildlife that could be coming to that garden. It, it is totally, um, totally linked to sustainability. Our food systems greatly depend on it. One out of every three bites of food is dependent on pollination. You know, we want to increase the amount of diverse species. So if you go to a garden center, they might have a hundred species of flowers there and they're pretty and we usually buy plants that we think are going to be pretty. But what about some of those weeds we take out all the time? Um, dandelions, there's white clover on the ground here. Everything that's in our lawns is so important. If it, if it blooms, it's coming at a time when pollinators are flying everywhere to look for something for, for pollen and nectar. If you use Roundup on your lawn, you might be making a pollinator desert. So in that sense, we're educating people about thinking about their lawns as pollinator habitat, as, as pollinator food banquets, and just dropping those seeds of information could help uh, create more citizen science, more pollinator stewards. Plant some dill for attracting swallowtails. What do monarchs lay their eggs on? I used to pull milkweed. I used to pull milkweed up until maybe five years ago. And then as soon as I realized that's the only plant that, that monarchs lay their eggs on, I, I like, oh my gosh. So that realization is important to create sustainable practices. It's a, it's a big learning curve. It's a big learning curve. In the next chapters, I'll circle back to the Northampton Energy Sustainability Commission and learn more about efforts to reduce carbon emissions from transportation and waste, and continue these conversations with local residents tackling climate change in their professional work.